I became an economist to understand the world better. I want to understand why some people have better jobs and earn more than others. Why some people adopt innovation faster than others. And why ultimately some countries are more prosperous than others. And it's truly fascinating that the answer to all of these questions seems to be it's the skills that people have. However, research on skills is still in its infancy and I'm very excited to be part of it. Growing up in socialist Macedonia and observing the generation of my parents, it seemed that neither the type of education nor how much education you got mattered that much for whether you have an employment or how much you earned at your job. Basically, everyone was employed and everyone earned more or less the same wage. I found striking differences in how the labor markets work when visiting countries such as Denmark, the US or Germany. I found these differences fascinating. Ferdinand Graf Zeppelin was born in the year 1838 into a wealthy aristocratic family in southern Germany. As was typical for aristocratic sons, he started a military career. As was rather untypical, he interrupted his military assignments to study engineering, chemistry and economics. He wanted to learn about modern technologies and how they could solve problems of his day. In 1874, at the age of 26, he noted down in his diary the basic concept of an airship. But it would take 36 more years until he was 62 years old, until he could finally release a first prototype into the air. It then took another 10 years until his Zeppelin airship business was thriving and made it possible for passengers to travel in comfortable cabins like this one by air all around the world. During all this time, Ferdinand Zeppelin was convinced that knowledge would prevail over prejudice, that skills would be the foundation of success. It took another 100 years to prove to what extent this is true, that indeed knowledge and skills are the basis for higher incomes. Dr. Ljubica Nedelkoska of the Zeppelin University and Dr. Simon Wiederhold of the IFO Institute in Munich are among the group of researchers who are delivering this proof. They are showing us their results. Increasing your cognitive skills can serve many goals. It can empower you to be an independent citizen and to participate in society. It can also increase health consciousness and prevent criminal behavior. The case for skills can hence be made from many perspectives. In this video, we make the economic case for skills. We will show you how skills matter for employment and earnings in modern labor markets. Our skills are in large part acquired through activities such as schooling, training or learning on the job. While these activities are costly, they should also entail some future benefit or some sort of return. From an economic perspective, the main return to skills is an increase in productivity at the job. Skills make people more productive by, for instance, enabling them to adopt new technologies or to come up with new innovative solutions. But how do we measure productivity and skills? In economics, we believe that productivity is mainly reflected in your salary. However, when it comes to skills, it would be good to have an indicator of what people actually know and not how much time they spend at school or university. Moreover, it would be good to measure skills the same way across countries and cultures. Such survey has only recently been conducted on 160,000 adults from 24 countries 
representing close to 75% of the GDP worldwide. The graph presents the results of the survey. The y-axis shows the percentage by which hourly wages increase when skills increase by a given unit. Higher skills are systematically related to higher wages in all countries. The gray bar shows that, on average, an increase in general cognitive skills by one unit is associated with an increase in wages by 18% across countries. But perhaps the most striking finding from the international analysis is the substantial variation in returns to skills across countries. Estimated returns to skills in the countries with the highest returns, being the United States, Ireland and Germany, are twice as large as in the countries with the lowest returns, being Czech Republic, Sweden and Norway. Why are the returns to same skills so different across countries? Intriguingly, returns to skills are systematically lower in countries with higher union density, stricter employment protection legislation and larger public sectors. Moreover, we also find that better skills shield against the risk of getting unemployed in all countries we are looking at. We can conclude that employers highly reward cognitive skills, although some countries pay better than others. Is this also true for more specific skills? My colleague Jubica will now share with us insights from recent research on more specific skills. Each time we acquire skills, we actually acquire specific skills. For instance, when deciding whether to go to university or not, we do not only decide on that, but also whether we should specialize in law, mathematics, arts, or something else. These are very important decisions because the economic value of all these skills may be very different, even if we spend the same amount of classroom time learning each one of them. So what can economics tell us about the returns to specific skills? The research on the returns to specific skills is in an earlier stage than the research on the returns to general skills, because specific skills are even more difficult to measure and compare across places than general skills. One type of cognitive skills, however, can be well measured today due to contributions coming from cognitive psychology. The word is about complex problem-solving skills, or CPS, as we will refer to them. Complex problem-solving skills, you probably remember, were explained by a previous lecture by Professor Samuel Greif. In a study that enabled us to investigate the returns to specific skills, in particular complex problem-solving skills, our team assessed the CPS skills of about 700 employees in eight different countries. So what do employers pay for the complex problem-solving skills of their employees? We find that they pay quite a bit. All things equal, employees who have one unit higher CPS skills earn 10 to 20% higher hourly wages. Moreover, and for the first time, we find that employers pay for CPS skills on top of general intelligence. This is encouraging because we know that in the case of fluid intelligence, it's very difficult to train it after childhood, while CPS skills may be trainable even in adulthood. This is a topic that we're currently investigating. Overall, modern economies highly reward skills. By reducing unemployment and increasing earnings, investing in people's education and skills can ultimately help us avoid poverty and reduce social exclusion. One has to understand, however, that not all skills are equal, equally rewarded at the market. Some skills, like complex problem-solving skills, are highly rewarded and recognized by employers. There are, however, many open research questions that we were not able to address so far. Where do people acquire problem-solving skills? To what extent can we, as adults, learn problem-solving skills? By participating in our CPS assessments that you have probably done, 
you actually advance our research agenda. We would like to thank you for that.